we will start with NumPy broadcasting. This is the first, let's say, the, mo the most straightforward way to, to accelerate code when you're writing code in NumPy. Um, it's actually quite simple most of the time. And, and then I will focus, of course, on the simplest things instead of, or, I mean, it's just supposed to be a primer, a, a pointer. Uh, but it, you can do very advanced things with with broadcast with broadcasting. Although it's like it's a bit, it gets a bit hard to read after a while uh, if you go and if you start doing too too complex things. But when you do some simple things that can accelerate your code very much, they they are actually readable. So there's there's this like trade off that that you have between. Um, complex code and the complexity or the performance that you get. And of course, this balance is up to you. It depends on how deep you want to go with the, you know, how, how, how deep you want to go in order to tip this balance towards performance or readability. Uh, we talked a lot about NumPy vectorization in the previous lecture. So that's, let's just make a very quick recap about what is a vectorized operation. I guess by now, hopefully, all of you are familiar with that. But uh, basically, a vectorized operation is an operation that works on the whole vectors at the same time. Right? It's, uh, it looks like a normal math operation, but it actually works on the whole vector at the same time. Uh, like, like, like in this case, for example, we have X, which is a vector that's one, two, three, and then we have Y, and then we multiply them. And we, get, we, get an array, we get an array of four, 10, 18, which is basically the first element of X times the first element of Y, the second element of, of X times the second element of Y, and then so on and so forth. So you have four, 10, and 18. I hope you guys are all familiar by now with this, and I hope you remember or you noticed that this is much, much, much faster than if you did it without vectorizing, right? So in this case, an alternative would be to actually loop through and then multiply them using Python, for example, if you're not using NumPy. And that would be much, much slower. And, you know, you remember that I explained to you why this is faster in the, and it's faster because NumPy is actually native code, right? So NumPy is not Python. NumPy is, is written in C or C++ or even assembly sometimes. Uh, so it's very, very low level code, very, very high level, uh, highly optimized, but it's not Python. Uh, it has a Python interface, so you can call it from Python, but it actually runs in like native compiled code and that's why it's faster so every time you you do a vectorized operation like this you can you can think that actually what you're doing is you're running c code to do this thing uh outside of the python interpreter this is this is going to come into come into play later when we talk about parallel processing but for now just just think about it like okay if i'm doing vectorized operations then i'm actually running native binary code not Python, because Python is low and native code is much faster. Uh, so you can see here that every element Z equals, yeah, each element of X and Y. Uh, and the, the thing that I want to, to show you here is that this is easy for NumPy, like, uh, because there are restrictions that like you cannot, you cannot do vector, apply vectorized operations all the time. In this specific situation, it was easy for NumPy to, to guess what you mean by by writing x plus y because x and y have exact same shape. So there's no, there's nothing ambiguous about what you're saying. It's like, I want every element of x times every element of y, that's obvious. So it's easy for NumPy to guess what you want to do. So every time there's a, the two arrays have the exact same shape and it doesn't have to be like this, a, a simple 1D array, it could be 2D arrays, it could be anything actually. As long as they have the exact same shape, then there, that's easy. NumPy simply says, okay, I understand what you mean. That's it. You're, so so you, you can always think like every time you do this, you're actually offloading the work to the binary code 
to the native code because that's easy. NumPy understands what you mean. And broadcasting comes into play when, when this is not as obvious as it is right now. There are still, there are still ways in which, in which you can still tell NumPy like, okay, this is not absolutely obvious. They're not the exact same shape, but, but still I want to offload this operation to the native code anyway. So in a way you can, you can even think about it as if you were compiling your loops, which is the main way that you can do to make your code run faster. Um, so this, we have an example here, and this is a very simple benchmark for two different implementations. And let's run it again, just so you can see what's happening here. Uh, this is basically a comparison between what we just did here with a vectorized multiplication and the, the alternative, which would be to loop through and do the same thing, but you know, um, without vectorizing. And I wanted to, to show you this for, for a couple of reasons. First, because you know, it's, it's easy to say, well, vectorize is faster, but, uh, but you, sh you should always, always uh, use the tools that you have in your disposal to check these things, because that's not always the case. If you do it wrong, then maybe you get no performance improvement. And then maybe you, you'll be like scratching your head, well, what's happening? I don't understand, I should get an improvement and I don't. So it's always good to, you know, have the tools to perform these checks yourself. Whatever we're gonna do for the rest of this lecture, we're always gonna be doing checks, performance checks. And so, so this, this is one way to, to do that. And I wanted to introduce, I think there, there are a couple of new concepts here that I, are important to you as you go. So, um, so yeah, I have two implementations here. One is vectorized, the other isn't. I hope this is obvious, like this is, I, I don't think I need to explain this. If, if it isn't, then please let me know uh, because maybe I'm, I'm wrong and I can explain, no problem. Uh, and then I'm, I'm initializing X and Y here, both of them as large random vectors, right? So both of them have 100,000, well, not super large, but they're large-ish, uh, 100,000 random elements. Uh, and then, I'm um, making sure that the results are exactly the same. So I'm doing something that we call uh, an assertion here. So I'm asserting that these two things are equal. Um, this is, you can see here, this is not a function, right? I'm not, it's, it's, it's like a Python uh, built-in statement that basically what, what, what it does is, if this thing here is not true, then simply we get an error. So here what I'm doing is like, uh, I'm, I'm taking the vectorized version, I'm taking the loop version, then I say equals. What happens here, it's not, it's not in immediately obvious, but it's important for you to understand. Since this, both of these things are actually vectors, right? Even though this, this one is a loop, but still the result is an actual vec, um, NumPy array. When I do this thing here, I'm, I'm basically asking if an array, which is large, it's like 100,000 elements, is equal to another array. And what this actually means is, again, um, I want to know if all the elements here are actually equal. And you know what, just so you know, just so you see what I mean, I guess I should actually give you an example because it, maybe this is not super obvious. Uh, I'm gonna run this again. And yeah, so you see this print statement here resulted in this thing here. So true, 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 true. What is this? This means that the first, the first elements are, yes, the same, the second are the same, the third are the same, so on, so on, so on, until you get to the third to last, the second to last, and then the last one. So this is, in a way, you can think of this as also a vectorized operation. It's like, I want to compare all elements from this vector to this vector. So it's not, it's not just, I just wanted to make it across uh, to show to you that this is not like, I'm not checking if the objects themselves, the arrays themselves are the same array because they aren't, right? I, I generated them separately. What I'm checking here is if all elements are true. 
So that's why I, I call this np.all. np.all basically checks, okay, if all elements are true, then this is true. If not, then it gives a problem, it gives an, uh, an error, right? Since we didn't get an error, since the code just basically pushed through until the end, that means there was no error, okay? Again, we can, uh, I can give you an example just so you, you can see. For example, if I take this multi, multi loop or whatever here, and then I just like sum one to it, uh, and then I check again, I get an assertion error, right? So basically the assertion failed. These two vectors are not the same anymore. So basically everything stops, okay? It's one way of doing it. Like you could, you could do it with an if, you could check with an if, oh, is it, are they the same or not, blah, blah, yeah. But uh, a certain like this is, is one way of doing it. it. Just You just completely cancel everything if they're not the same. Enough with that, so I hope, I hope it's clear. Uh, and then we go to this time it thing here, which is something that I was asked uh, in the forum that I sent around. Someone asked me, how can I benchmark simple statements? And uh, the, the answer is that, of course, as, as always in Python, there are many ways to do it. Time it is usually the most common. Um, and now I'm, you can see I've imported it from up here, from time it, import time it, for, because for some reason time it is the name of the package and it's also the name of the function that you call. So, so then I just did this so I don't have to, to call like time it, dot time it, time it, dot time it all the time. So I just simplified it here. Uh, so time it is, the, is one of the functions that we can call in order to test the benchmark of whatever you're doing, okay? And here's how it works. Again, there is a couple of new concepts here that I think it's important to understand because we're gonna reuse this a million times until we get to the end of the lecture. So I will try to kind of introduce them to you now. The first thing is this Lambda thing. I don't know how many of you have actually used Lambdas in Python. Um, and and it's, it's actually super simple. A Lambda is nothing but an anonymous inline function, okay? Well, because time it, when, when you wanna time something, when you want to, to, to check how, how long it takes to run a certain statement or, or something or a code, you need to have it packaged in, in a function or in something that you can run because time it must run something, right? So a certain, let's say code, little package of code that you want to test. And uh, so you need to, to, to send it, you need to send something to time it that it can run in order to, to, to do the performance check. And this is a way, this is a simple way that you can do it is by creating this Lambda, which is just a simple anonymous um, inline function. Uh, and then basically what it means here is that time it will run this, this statement here. And this number 100 means I want to run it 100 times. And again, there's, a, there's some, sometimes if, if it's slow, of course, you shouldn't run it 100 times. If it takes 10 seconds, then you shouldn't run it 100 times or, or else you're going to be waiting for a long time. But if it's a very small thing, like it takes uh, less than a, than a millisecond to run, then it doesn't make sense to run it just once to benchmark. Then you, run, you must run it a few times before you can actually benchmark something. So in this case, I'm running it 100 times and you can still see that it's like super still super fast. The loop version is not super fast, but the vectorized version is. So if I, if I didn't run it, if I run it like 10 times, for example, then it's, it becomes really, really, really fast. So it's very hard to compare anything. I mean, you, you, of course you can still compare it. You can still see that it's much faster, but, uh, but the smaller it gets, the it's, it's uh, harder to trust the results because it's so little, you know, anything can, can affect the runtime of something that takes so, that runs in such a fast uh, way. So then we run it many times and then it's easier to compare because then there, there's less 
less uh, impact on you know external factors on the benchmark. Uh, but again, all of this is really just based on your use case and what, what you're doing. Now, just just to get a point across, I'm uh, I'm getting some questions. I will answer them uh, soon. So just just to get a point the, the point across, this thing would be the same as if I define the function here, something like uh, function one, doesn't matter, uh, without any arguments. And then I, I take this code here, I put it here. And then instead of calling, instead of sending a lambda here, I just send function one, for example. So I'm saying, hey, the thing that I want to time is actually implemented in function one. Uh, and it's this thing here. And it doesn't matter if you return it or not, the, the, the results are exactly the same. So, so the, the, what I want to, to show you here is that a lambda is again, nothing but just a simple inline function. Uh, and that you, in, in a lambda, you cannot, you cannot write more than one line of code like this. Actually not a line of code, it's one, one statement of code here like this. That's all you can do in a lambda. So, uh, so it's just like a, a quick, short way of defining an anonymous function that's just going to be called once. So I don't need to give it a name, or, or I don't need to I don't need to call it back anywhere else. So I don't need to define the actual function. You know, I could I could do that, but then it's like it gets the code gets larger, and I have to define a lot of temporary functions that I'm never going to use again because this is just I'm just using it once. So then that's why I define this lambda. Uh, yeah, and, and basically that's it. That's how time it works. Uh, we're going to use it millions of times before we end this lecture. So I hope that at least uh, the initially the, the idea is, is there. Now I'm going to uh, answer some questions. We have two questions. One is from Derek. How should we test time floating point numbers are equal to zero? Great question. Uh, we're going to do this very soon, probably like in a couple of cells below. Um, that's a great question. You cannot use, th this assertion that I used here cannot be used with floating point numbers at all, whether you're um, comparing them to zero or anything. Why? Because sometimes if a floating point, it's, it's very hard, like it, the, the concept of just comparing to floating point numbers usually does not work. Uh, not comparing, like uh, asking if they're equal. Maybe they are equal when, when they are actually exact. So there, it's an integer in, in a floating point, let's say a uh, number, but it's most of the time it doesn't work because even if the 10th decimal is different, then they're different. Uh, so, so there's another one, there's another function on NumPy, which is called all close, where you compare to, to arrays up to a certain precision usually up to like eight decimal points. So you consider that if, if two floating point numbers are equal up to the eighth you know, decimal, then they're equal. Uh, so that's, that's what we're gonna use in the, in, the, in the next ones. This is actually, I think the last time that I actually compared this. Uh, and in this case, uh, it worked, but as you will see later, for, for a little bit more complex operations, it won't work, okay? This worked because this is really, really simple operation. So we're not, we're not gonna use this anymore. I hope that's the, the question, that, that I answered the question correctly. Can't you just avoid lambda? So oh, that next question from, from uh, David. Can't you just avoid lambda? The function is already a function, right? Yes, great question. Yes and no. Actually, you cannot avoid the lambda here. And the reason is, because I need to pass it a specific set of arguments or parameters here, x and y. And uh, some, in, in some cases, um, not for time it, but in some cases, in other, uh, as you will, we will see actually this, uh, an example of this later. Uh, in some cases you can, because in some cases you, you, can, you can pass the function name and then you can pass like a, uh, a list of arguments. And then that works. If, if that was available for time it, that would work, but that's not available. For, so for time it, you actually have to, to, to give it like a specific statement that you want to run, period. So, so in this case, I cannot avoid the lambda or I, can, I could not avoid creating like a wrapper function like this um, 
that would do the exact same thing of, that the lambda does like this, simply because I have to wrap the parameters. I have to call multivect with a specific set of parameters, X and Y. So in this case, I need to wrap it around something. Uh, and that's what I did. Is that clear? I hope, I hope it's clear. If it's not, let me know. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, we're, we're gonna end up wrapping things around lambdas and, and functions all the time for, for many things. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, Derek, I please send, uh, that question is a little bit unrelated. Yeah, so, so either I will answer you after the lecture or, or send me a message on Moodle or something like this, and then I can, I can, I can definitely tell you why it's not uh, working later. So broadcasting now, okay. Broadcasting is a special type of vectorization that is available in NumPy. We already saw this before, but did not discuss it in detail. So what does that mean? We, I, I just glossed over this uh, previously because I didn't want to get into the details, but we already saw broadcasting. Like for example, if you do this, this is a super simple thing that we just did here. Uh, I just, it's basically the same thing it was did before, but Y is not a vector anymore. Now Y is a number, right? So why is 10? And, and still, NumPy lets me do that, no problem. So I take the X vector, 5, 10, 15, then I multiply it with the number, 10, and then still, NumPy still can say, okay, yeah, no problem. Even though the shapes of these two things are not the same, I still understand what you mean. I mean, I, I understand that you want to multiply Y times every element in X. So that makes sense. Like the, the M, it's not ambiguous. It's less, it's less clear than it was before, but it's still manageable, right? And basically, what you, one, one interesting thing to think here is that Y was implicitly extended to match the shape of X, okay? So it's not just that, it's, it's easy to, to just think that NumPy simply looped over the vector and then, you know, multiplied it. But, be, but that, that's just, that is obvious in this example, but as the examples get complex and more, more, more and more complex, then you will see that this kind of thinking is not, might not translate it well. So I, I want you to think always when you're doing broadcasting that the, the element or the vector with a, a smaller shape, so to speak, than the other one is actually being extended to match the, the shape of the larger vector or the, the vector with the, the larger shape. So in this case, X has a shape of three because it's just this one axis with three elements. While Y has a shape of just one because it's just one element. So Y is then being extended in this way, as I've put it here in the description. So it becomes, in a way you can think of it, that it becomes a vector with three, with three elements, which is the same as X, but with three repeated elements, 10, 10, 10, or Y, Y, Y. And, um, but again, this is just implicit. This is not actually happening, okay? It's very important to, to understand this. It's an implicit thing you don't necessarily, or actually not necessarily, but it doesn't, it's not copied in memory. Like you don't, you don't take these values and you copy them and you make a new array and then you, you do the vectorizing. You, you think of it that way, but that's not what, it ha what happens, okay? So NumPy is smart enough to not require this to happen. Um, but as soon as both vectors have the same shape, even if implicitly, then the vectorized operations can be applied as usual. So that's how, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a nice way to think about what's happening here. First, one of the, the vectors is being adjusted to fit the other vector, to have the same shape, and then the vectorized operation can be applied as usual, okay? Uh, and in other words, you can think that Y was broadcasted to the shape of X to obtain Z. Uh, that's why it's called broadcasting because you take something and then you kind of, you repeat it a few times until it has the same shape 
as the other one. And I'm, and I'm always talking about like one thing being broadcasted to match the shape of other thing, but that's not always the case. You don't have to have one smaller shape than the other. It's, they, maybe they both have similar shapes, but they're not uh, totally compatible. They can still be adjusted to each other. One can be adjusted to each other. I will try to give you example, an example below. So let's consider a slightly more complex example below. This is, this is still a simple one, okay? Y is an array and X is a matrix. And X, well, the shape of X here is two by three, right? So we have two rows by three columns, while Y here has a shape of three because it only has one row and three columns. We could, we could even say it's like one by three, but I, that's not true because you don't have two X's here, you only have one. So um, that's not how you should think of it. You should think of it of having just a shape of three because there's just one axis. While X have two, has two axes, it's well, the rows and the columns. So that's why you have two by three. Um, and, and again, this works exactly the same, right? So I can do it and, and, and let's see if, tell me if it's not obvious what just happened. I guess it's obvious, um, but Y was basically extended again to match X shapes. So this is what I, Y becomes here, two rows of one, five, 10, because first we only had one row. Now we have two rows. Now this, this new shape here is actually two by three, which is the exact same shape as X. And then the vectorized operation is applied normally. So then you can see that one, five, and 10 was actually summed to each row here. So we get like two, seven, 10, and five, 10, 16, because, you know. But again, this is not what, this is, this is not in memory, okay? This is just implicit. You can think of it that, that way, but that's not actually what's happening in the memory. Yeah, so uh, again, the, this situation was real, relatively easy, easy for NumPy. I will actually t uh, discuss later what exactly means what being easy or not, but, but still, it was kind of easy because extending Y to match the, the shape of X was more or less straightforward. You just repeated the row once more. And that, and that was enough to make it fit with X shape. But of course, this, this will get harder and harder for NumPy depending on what you do. Like for example, this, this fails, right? You can see that actually X here is more or less the same of what it was before, but it's transposed, right? So now you have one, two, three in the first column, and four, five, six in the second column, and then y, y is the same, and I tried to do the same thing, and I couldn't. So actually, the, the, the message is very informative. Operands could not be broadcast together with shapes three and two and, and three. So these shapes, although these ones were compatible, these ones are not compatible because there's no straightforward way for you to take Y and repeat it somehow or extend it somehow or broadcast it somehow and then make it fit axis shape. Well, and then, you, so, so then you get an error. Okay, so NumPy, NumPy does not, I mean, obvious, th there's obviously some, some idea here that I guess if, if you do something like this, then probably what you wanted to do was to broadcast Y over the columns instead of the rows, right? So for us, I guess as a human being, uh, that, that's obvious. But, but NumPy does not try to guess these things. So instead of guessing, it just says, look, I couldn't do it. Uh, I don't understand what you mean. Please fix this. Uh, so considering that maybe, or probably, what you wanted to do here was to broadcast Y over the columns instead of the rows, then one way to do it is simply to reshape Y in such a way that it is then compatible with X. And for example, this, what, this is what I did here. I reshaped Y into, three, into a shape of three by one. So that means instead of being a row vector, it becomes a column vector of three rows and one column. And then I can broadcast it with X, no problem. And then we get the exact same result that we got here, but it's transposed because that's what you would expect to get. Now, one, one thing that sometimes people 
uh, get confused here about this is that, you know, usually when you read a math book or any kind of math, uh, you know, operations with vectors or linear algebra, when you talk about a vector like y, it's usually a column vector in math notation. If you, if you just say this is a vector, then it's usually considered as a column vector. But NumPy is different. So with NumPy, when you talk about a vector like y, it's actually a row vector. So that's why you, that's why you could do this in a straightforward way. You could just take this and, and broadcast here because this was considered to be a row vector. So then it was easy. Uh, but uh, so if you want to make y, to turn y into a, into a column vector, then you have to reshape it like this, okay? And also something, another thing that confuses people somehow uh, sometimes is you cannot transpose y here. It doesn't work like this because again, NumPy. NumPy does not let you transpose uh, a vector y that is, that is just has a shape that is just has one axis. You can't transpose it into a column because then it would become a vector with a shape with two values. And, and then it, it, it doesn't do that automatically. You have to actually force it because when I do like this, then actually if you, if you check the shape of this thing here, the shape is not just three anymore. It's actually three by one. So it becomes like a matrix with one column. Then it has two, two axes in its shape. Uh, you know, that's why you have to force the reshape here. You cannot just transpose it. Okay. It's just, that's just how NumPy works. Another small thing that I wanted to show here that, that is neat is that you can do it like this. So um, instead of actually putting three by one here, because I mean, I know this is a, this vector has three elements. So I can just say, yeah, three by one, whatever. But if you didn't know, or if you didn't want to, to, to worry about this, you could actually use this minus one here, which basically means just put everything else here. Since, since I'm, I'm actually stating that this reshaped vector should have one column, then fit the rest in the rows. And then if Y had 50 uh, elements, then you would have 50 rows, so on and so forth. Then in, you kind of force here NumPy to guess, okay, just, just make, just put everything else in this axis that is not defined in the other axis, okay? And of course, you cannot do this with everything. Like if you try to do this, then it doesn't, doesn't work because then it says, cannot reshape array of size three into shape two because it is, that there's no way to fit this into two columns, right? So it doesn't work. So, I mean, you have to keep it in mind, like, yeah, I have to, I have to use some, some compatible shape here or else it doesn't work. But uh, this, this minus one thing here is, um, this minus one thing here is very interesting. Uh, it helps a lot, especially when you don't know the actual shape and then you have to check and keep checking, oh, what's the shape? How can I do it, blah, blah. And this way with minus one just helps a lot, uh, just much better. Yeah, and I got a message here from David saying, th I was fighting with the transpose of Y for a while. I did not know about reshape. Yeah, exactly. It's a story of everyone's life. <laughs> So, but, but just keep it in mind, it's not that, I mean, uh, transpose works most of the time. It, it, it just doesn't work in this way because what you expect to get here is, is not compatible. Like you, because it's not a, ma a matrix, uh, Y is not a matrix with two axes. It's, you know, so it, it works most of the time. Like I, I could even uh, show you here something that like, for example, this would, uh, uh, no, actually, it's the uh, opposite. <laughs> yeah, so this, for example, would work. See, I don't know if you if you understand the difference here, but but like because when I do this, actually, y stays exactly the same. It's one row and three columns in the same way as, as it is here. But now it has two axes, so now it's actually a matrix with one row and three columns, not a vector anymore. And then you can transpose it because then NumPy understands that the result of the transpose is still a matrix, but not, uh, you know, not in general. So let's just keep it as it is. Right, then broadcasting uh, is not only a way to write clean and shorter code, but it has the speed advantages of vectorized code. So basically when you broadcast, you're not just broadcasting to make things 
easier to read, which is one nice uh, effect. Like, of course, when you do this X plus Y, that is, you know, much better than if you were to run like, oh, four I in range, uh, the length of X, then blah, 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 you know, it's, uh, multiply every row of X against my vector, blah, blah, blah. That becomes a little bit like big. And so, yeah, there's a nice little, you know, side effect here that you get readable code. Uh, but that's not, that's not why you do it. You do it because of the performance. Of course, that's, that's the lecture of today is about that. So obviously, um, when you do this, you're actually, again, offloading all the work to the native code. So basically you're saying, look, instead of looping, again, let's, let's look at the simple example. Instead of uh, looping through the rows of X and multiplying Y by each row, because I could do that easily because then uh, each row of X has the same shape of Y, so I could just multiply them uh, straight away. You, what you're actually doing when you do this is you're compiling in a way your loop. Because I mean, again, let's say, yeah, NumPy is still looping. It's not, more or less. But uh, what you're doing, basically what you're doing is saying, instead of doing the loop here in Python, I'm gonna offload it to the native code. And that's where you get the um, performance improvements. So let's, let's do a benchmark here. Again, now, now we're still, uh, we're again going to use all the stuff that we used before, assertions, uh, lambdas and everything. Drop me a question if you don't understand something that's happening here, okay? So let's, let's think about what's happening here. I have a vectorized version of the multiplication. So just, it's a multiplication now, it's not a, a sum anymore. So X times Y. And you see that I use uppercase letters for matrices and lowercase letters for vectors, just to make it clear. Then I have uh, a version here, which is basically like, a mix between vectorized and loops. So I'm, I'm, I am looping through each row of, of X here. So for I in range X dot shape zero, I'm basically looping through each of the rows of X. And then for each row, I'm actually multiplying it by the vector. So it's that, there's a vectorized operation over here, right? In each row. Uh, but the but the loop is not vectorized, so the loop is still Python and is still slow. And then I have a pure Python version here, which basically has no vectorizing whatsoever. So I'm just uh, looping through the rows, and then I'm looping through the columns, and then I'm multiplying each individual element. And this is, I mean, it's going to be much slower. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to run this, and while it runs, I'm, I, I can uh, explain the rest. And then I'm generating a matrix here that has 30,000 rows by 10 columns against a vector of 10 columns, just to make them compatible here. They're all random, doesn't matter. Uh, but this, this looks like a data set, right? Like this could be a data set that you get 30,000 in instances and 10 features, for example. This is the same format that you would get in uh, basically any data set out there. Then of course, there's, there are the assertions here. I just wanna make sure that they are the same. And again, here, I'm still using this NP all here, but we're gonna move on from this uh, in a while, just because this is very simple and, and it works. So I'm, I'm checking if uh, the vectorize is the same as the loop vectorized. And then I'm checking if the vectorize is the same as the loop. And again, this is kind of like a, a, an obstacle. If, if something's wrong, just stop here. If it doesn't stop here, then that's because it works. And then the benchmarks, right? So again, the same as we did before, the vectorized version, the loop plus vectorized version, and the loop, pure Python loop version. So you can see here, that's a very, very nice uh, comparison. The vectorized version, well, you know, the, these are the actual values in seconds of running this thing. Each one of them was, was uh, executed 100 times. And the results are really, really incredible. When you have the purely vectorized version, so uh, yeah, the, the loop plus vectorized version was 73 times slower and the loop version was 320 times slower. So, um, 
and I mean, I say vectorized, but it's actually broadcasted, right? It's not just vectorized because again, X and Y are not the same shape. They're, they have compatible shapes, right? The, um, the Y can be extended 30,000 times in order to fit X's shape, but that's not just vectorized. Vectorized, just, just vectorized would be the two things that had exactly the same shape, um, but they don't. Uh, and still you see that the vectorized version for, for running it a hundred times, it was executing in 0 0.05 seconds while the, last, the loop plus vectorized was three seconds and the pure Python loop was 16 seconds. So um, I guess this, this cell here by itself should be good enough motivation to push you into learning how to do broadcasting. Um, because it really, really, really pays. Uh, again, it's like compiling a loop and loops are usually or always the slowest part <laughs> of anything that you're writing, any code that you're writing. Okay. Now you may be thinking, well, like, okay, but how, how do I know if, uh, how do I know how, if, if two things are compatible? Like I could, I could run this thing, but I couldn't run this thing. What's the difference? How do I know? Um, Basically, the rules are, you take the shapes of the, of if you're, let's say you're doing this, you have two arrays and you want to see if they can be broadcasted or if one can be broadcasted into the other. So you take the shape. So let's take this, let's consider the shape for this example. And then X had this shape and Y had this shape, right? Uh, so X had the shape 30,000 by 10 and why had the shape, shape of 10. Now, you start from the end to the beginning, and then you look at each pair of, of uh, values at, uh, at a time. So for example, let's start with the last here. So X has, the last one is 10, and for Y, the last one is also 10. It's the only one, so it's the last one. They are the same. So basically that means they're compatible, like for now, <laughs> for, the, for this specific axis. So this specific axis, they are compatible because it's one stand is the other, the other stand. So that works, they're the same. And then you jump to the next one, like backwards from the last one to the second last one. And then in the case of X is 30,000, but in the case of Y, there is nothing because it's over, right? So in that case, you can kind of consider that for, for Y, this is one because it's not non-existent. So if it's not existent, if it's not present, then you consider it as uh, being one, as being one. It could be one explicitly, it would work the same. But if it's not there, then you consider it as being one. And then the, the rule is that if one of the axes is one, then they are actually also compatible. It's not compatible if they're different but one of them is not one. So for example, if Y had a, a, was like, I don't know, 200 by 10, then that wouldn't work because then it would be 30,000 against 200. And then that would not be compatible. So it's, it's compatible. There are two rules for compatibility. Two axes must be either the same or one of them must be one. And then they're compatible. And if, in, and again, this, this works for any shape. Like if you had five axes in a certain array, you would just go from the last to the first and then each, each pair you would compare, are they the same or is one of them one? Yes, then okay, let's go to the next one. And then if you make it to the end and all of the axes, all of the pairs of axes are compatible, then the two arrays are compatible and then they can be broadcasted against each other, okay? Like for example, in this case, this was not, com they, they were not compatible in the, when you had the, um, yeah, in this case, they were not compatible. Why? This shape is three by two and this shape is three. So the first time you try to compare, like you take the last one here is two and the last one here is three, they're not the same and one of them and neither of them are one. So they're not compatible, period. That's it. The, the whole thing stops and not, nothing is done, okay? Now, you may be thinking, well, okay, if they're the same, I can understand, but what happens, why is it that it's compatible when one of them is one? Well, it is compatible when one of them is one, 
because that is exactly where the vector will be extended. So for example, in here, you have 30,000 by 10, and then here you have only 10, but like I said, if it's not present, then you consider it as one. So that this one here that you could consider, like you can consider it as being something like this implicitly, right? So uh, if, if it was something like this, these are compatible. And then this one is exactly the one that's going to be extended to fit 30,000. So, so basically you could think of uh, that Y is repeating itself 30,000 times throughout this one axis over here. And that's why, it's, um, that's why they're compatible. And, and that's where you should think like you're, you're um, compiling your loop because if, if you were to do this in a loop, then you would have to loop 30,000 times and repeat this vector 30,000 times anyway, al along this, this one specific axis. And this is exactly where I say, okay, this is where I'm compiling my loop because this axis here will be repeated 30,000 times. So uh, this, this is the kind of thing that you have to, you know, use it to uh, a couple of times to understand. It's not super, uh, you know, clear. I have, an, uh, I have another example here uh, using the um, Euclidean distance matrix, matrix, which is something we do all the time, right? Uh, I've, I've seen questions on Slack about this, like how to, com to compute uh, Euclidean distance in the best way possible. Uh, and also not only the Euclidean dis distance itself, but uh, like having a matrix of Euclidean distances, because sometimes you have a, an array like you have here, 30,000 by 10, and then you want to know the distance of everyone against everyone. That all the time you need something like that. So uh, this is a, there's an example here where uh, we're, I'm benchmarking many different implementations of this using different levels of broadcasting. And uh, I'm gonna leave it a little bit as an exercise for you guys to check later. And then you can get back to me if you don't understand. But basically you can see that by the time we get to the two final versions, uh, I get um, a distance matrix that's 243 times uh, faster than the slowest one. So depending on how you're doing it in your code, then maybe you wanna take a look at this and learn a little bit about the broadcasting here so that you can actually maybe um, accelerate your own code that you're using for like computing nearest neighbors and things like that. That's that computing nearest neighbors is one case where you could, where you, you might use a distance matrix. Um, actually, usually you, you have to, unless you're using some kind of approximated nearest neighbors. But uh, basically if you look at, look here, you see that this is the, this is just the Euclidean distance, non-optimized pure Python, mostly, mostly pure Python, not, not everything, but mostly. Um, then you have a loop here, which just, again, does the, the very dumbest possible approach of just computing the Euclidean distance of everything individually. Then you have, again, the loop plus vectorized version where I'm actually vectorizing the, the computation of the Euclidean distance. So it gets faster and faster as I move uh, down. Then there's the first broadcast, there's the second broadcast. And by the time we get to the second broadcast here, this is fully broadcasted, right? But it's, it's really hard to understand and actually does not give a lot of uh, improvement over the, the previous one. So this is kind of like the trade-off that I wanted to show you guys that there are two versions of broadcasting here. One of them has actually a loop, but then I'm broadcasting it over the, the entire role. And the other one is fully broadcasted, which is kind of like mind blowing in a, in a way how to, to understand what's happening here. Uh, but still you don't really get that much of a of an improvement anyway I, here we got a little bit more more of an improvement here but it's really like there's the trade-off here is very small so uh, if you want this to have the best best possible uh, performance probably this one would be the best but again since it's so hard to actually do this because you have to reshape axis x the whole matrix in two different ways and that's kind of like that's kind of weird uh, i would say that probably this version is the best trade-off between uh, readability 
and performance. Uh, it's a little bit of a mix of a loop and a vectorized version. Well, that's, that was it for broadcasting. I hope that was um, informative. I hope that is a good big start for you to begin you know, doing your own broadcasting because that's usually the first step in, towards making your code faster.